Russia and China, two major powers that are being drawn closer by the Belt and Road Initiative. I'll explore the spectacular wealth that's been created at the border of these two countries. I'll uncover the history of Russians in China. And I'll meet the latest friendship ambassadors of the Belt and Road. A Belt and Road initiative linking China and Russia has sparked celebration and concern. Rival powers, Russia and China. Russia and with China. Russia or China? In my journey along the road to Russia, I'll visit China's border cities with Russia. This entire city is lit in gold. I'll discover the splendors of Mongolia with its untapped riches. It's like a house on wheels. Yeah. Mysterious Uzbekistan through its stunning cities. <laughs> and I'll explore the Kremlin and the power it wields. This is my journey through one of China's key economic corridors on its Belt and Road. Tonight's topic is about the triangular relations between the US, China, and Russia, the world's great powers. So my first question is, what is the state of this trilateral relationship? Are we heading toward conflict? So clearly, Russia and China, the strategic relationship has evolved. And there's real security cooperation going on. There's arms sales from Russia to China. There's military joint exercises. I don't want to overstate that, but there is an idea about trying to cooperate globally to preclude the United States from gaining global hegemony. In the last year, much of the focus on international relations worldwide has been on a US-China trade war. One upshot from that is renewed attention on one of the world's oldest and most checkered bilateral relationships. I've been researching Sino-Russian relations, and I've become convinced that it's an important relationship to watch. The two countries' increasing alliance is making American and some European leaders uncomfortable. But is a China-Russia partnership so terrifying to begin with? Where do we begin unpacking this bilateral relationship that has more layers than a Russian doll? Well, here's a good place to start the world's largest Matryoshka doll square. Replete with domes, dolls, and other designer kish, this is a Disney-fied Russia. This is Manjoli, in northeast China, a border zone where Russia, Mongolia, and China meet. What's so amazing about this place is how China so openly advertises its Russian links. China has many friends, but I haven't seen the Chinese government building a Pakistan town or an Italian town to celebrate its bilateral relations. This place is absolutely one of a kind and a testament to Chinese-Russian ties. The doll square is empty because it's freezing winter. But make no mistake, Manjoli is a busy town. It's China's busiest land port. And it is the main rail gateway to Russia. 65% of all import-export trade runs along these tracks. And these tracks are now busier than ever. Trade between Russia and China soared by nearly 25% in 2018, reaching a record turnover 
of 108 billion U.S. dollars. Manjoli is also a special cross-border trade zone and has all sorts of facilities for logistics, customs, processing, exhibition, trading, supply chain finance, and so on. This is the Russian-China trade hub. But Manjoli's relationship with Russia isn't all about dollars and cents. It's also about friendship and goodwill between neighboring cities and states. And Manjoli has come up with new ways to promote those friendships. The pageant has a strategic objective. It's to promote China's friendship with Russia and shared neighbor, Mongolia. The China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor is one of six major corridors on the Belt and Road Master Plan. Mongolia的这次的服装还是细节做的还不错的，然后这个比较大气，然后能既能呈现这个民族特色，然后又能体现出一种皇家的这样的一种这个风范出来。Ma Yingzhe is one of the men in charge of organizing this cross-border extravaganza. So what does this beauty pageant have to do with the Belt and Road Initiative? Mandolin 这个文化交流，呃，旅游的这种互通，以及在经贸和这个这个商务方面的一些这个深度的合作，所以对我们整个地区的这个呃经济和这个文化是有很大很大的这样一个触动。Who are the organizers? 这个活动呢，实际上是由这个中欧盟三国的政府主办的。呃，当时呢，都是由这个满洲里市人民政府进行这个具体承办。在二零一四年的时候。the charm offensive is effective. The event is covered by more than a hundred media outlets in the three countries. How do you not win hearts and minds with this? These girls are walking around in so little clothing in temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius. I couldn't do it. This must be the toughest weather conditions any beauty pageant participant has to endure anywhere in the world. This is Mayigarin 
Russian-China relations are all smiles now, mostly. But there was a time when relations weren't so rosy. In the early 1950s, Russian and Chinese leaders dreamed of fashioning a world of communism. But by the late 60s, the two communist giants had entered into such a fierce battle for supremacy that they became bitter enemies. They even threatened to use nuclear weapons on each other. Thousands of Muscovites demonstrate outside the Chinese embassy in Moscow. The confrontation across the Usuri River, the far eastern frontier between the two countries, has provoked a king-size outburst of propaganda from both sides. The Russians claim that over 40 of their border guards have lost their lives. The most serious development has been the Russian threat to escalate the whole thing into a full-scale conflict, to initiate an offensive with nuclear weapons. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, the border dispute was also scaled down. In 1991, the two countries signed a pact demarcating their borders. And today, all bitterness from the past is hardly ever discussed. Nowadays, the dialogue revolves around excellent bilateral relations. In 2017, Putin presented Xi with Russia's highest state award. In 2018, Xi handed Putin a large golden medal of friendship, declaring the Russian leader his best, most intimate friend. The two leaders have met over 30 times since 2013. In addition to excellent trade ties, China and Russia support each other on a wide variety of foreign policy issues, including the Venezuela crisis, North Korea's nuclear program, and the Iran nuclear deal. Whatever the strategic reasons may be for the blossoming friendship, it's made Manjoli a boom town. With serious investment pouring into the Wild West frontier town of the Chinese border, Sino-Russian trade is taking off. And I'm off to meet a tycoon breaking it in from the Sino-Russian trade. You might find it surprising, but this is one of the biggest and most profitable businesses in Manjoli. Russia and China trade in many things. Oil, timber, electronics, you name it. But it's humble vegetables that are moving fastest. The reason has to do with politics. In 2014, Russia cut ties with its fruits and veggie suppliers from the European Union and US a retaliation against sanctions over the Ukraine issue. Russia has to buy its fruits and veggies elsewhere. That was when Putin turned to his old comrade in China. This is probably the most vegetables I've seen in my life. All of this is being sent to the Russian city of Irkutsk, 1,500 kilometers away. Four years ago, this journey would have taken seven days on the road, but today, that travel time has been cut in half because of all the new roads that have been built due to the Belt and Road Initiative. Chinese veggies are moving faster than ever. According to Russian government statistics, Russia buys one billion US dollars worth of veggies and 300 million US dollars worth of citrus fruits from China annually. This company alone, Senfu Logistics, exports $50 million worth of fruit and veggies to Russia a year. In 2018, their export volume to Russia grew 13% compared to the previous year. Meng Lin is the woman in charge. She moved to Manchuli 25 years ago, and Meng Lin has done very well. Wow, there are a lot of awards here. Congratulations. Uh, earlier today, I was able to check out your company, and I have to say, the place looked very busy. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the history of your business? 
，呃，我们企业是这样，是在两千年以前，我们在向俄罗斯进口有色金属的同时，然后发现俄罗斯的百姓还是对于我们中国的果蔬比较感兴趣，因为我们满洲里毗邻的这些，嗯，俄罗斯的呃地区，呃，天气比较寒冷，所以很难有那么多的这个那么多品种的水果和蔬菜。然后这样，我们从两千零二年开始就几乎是，呃，正正式走上了向俄罗斯出口果蔬的这条道路。取得这么多荣誉，也是各级政府还有我们一些合作伙伴对于我们这个企业工作的一个肯定吧。这个我还是比较很高兴，很荣幸。喝点茶吧。Oh sure, thank you. You were twenty-one years old when you first came to Manchuria. What was it that brought you here? 我那时候从电视上看见边贸热嘛，就来看一看，然后来，感觉还这个城市挺不错，很有前景，然后就留下来了。嗯，没想到一留留了二十多年。Wow, twenty-five years, huh? Time flies. What was Manjuli like back then? Manjuli 当时就是一个边陲小镇。我觉得到了晚上八九点以后，那个灯光都很少。好像都很很黑的，然后高楼大厦也没有。现在我们满洲里已经是一个非常繁荣的一个口岸城市了，主要以这个旅游和外贸为主。满洲里这个城市还是比较有建筑特点吧。我们几乎呃所有的建筑都会带有一点欧美的这个感觉嘛，非常有临近俄罗斯这么一个口岸城市的那种特点。And it's all thanks to Russia-China ties, huh? 基本上，满洲里现在大多的企业都是做，呃，对俄外贸，或者是说做呃旅游的企业也很多。We hear a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative. How has it impacted your business? 有了一带一路以后吧，嗯、呃，从呃我们这个角度来说，从运输上首先是比以前更方便、更快捷了。然后从铁路运输上也是一样，我们现在开通了很多的这个班列，然后通过这些班列呢，可以让我们的一些产品更方便、更快捷的来到达俄罗斯很多城市，因为提高了运力，提高了速度，然后现在就增加了好多我们以前不敢想的一些新鲜品种，比如说以前我们很难想象，呃，能把芒果，呃，从南方。运到我们北方，然后再运到这个俄罗斯百姓的餐桌上。但是现在，因为通过“一带一路”的这个对我们这个运输的速度上的提高，所以现在我们也增加了很多新鲜品种的对俄出口。Mangoes, once an exotic rarity across the border, can now be bought in Russian supermarkets, even in Siberia. These foreign fruit are now much more accessible thanks to the new trade links. Just another example of how China's Silk Road is changing the world. To your successful partnership with Russia. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the boom town that is Manjoli, a Chinese city with an obvious Russian feel to it everywhere you turn. There's a good reason why. Manjoli is the poster city for exciting developments in Sino-Russian trade. The thriving tempo of cross-border trade is best felt here at the Manjoli Trade Center. It's the city's official cross-border trade zone. It's not even 9 a.m., and already a long queue has formed outside. They're here for one thing mainly, wheat flour. Bags and bags of the stuff fly off the shelves here, bound for shops and restaurants across the city. It's a flower frenzy, driven not by traders but by very entrepreneurial townsfolk. 
So this morning, there was a long line of people waiting to get in here. Mm. Can you tell me what that was about? Mm. Uh, and this happens on a daily basis then. Uh, Bread is a must have in this part of China. Flour may be the star product. But there's also trade in candies, chocolates, honey, skin care, cooking oil, and all kinds of Russian products imaginable. The Manjoli Trade Center isn't just any other Russian departmental store. For the local government, it's a shining example of how both sides of the border have plenty to gain from the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh,一般贸易来讲呢,你得需要进口商品,需要缴纳关税,呃,进口环节增值税和消费税。在我们互贸免税区里面,这些税是都没有。是为零,所以你的商品进,通过这种模式进入中国呢,它的市场的竞
Thank you so much. Your Mandarin is quite good. <laughs> what, what made you want to study Chinese? Uh, Do you have many friends from Russia who want to work here? Is the salary higher here compared to Russia? Do you have many Russians applying to work at your restaurant? So what's the process of hiring a Russian? 基本上我们申请一个工人手续，以前可能要等到两三个月，现在十天十天八天就能解决的问题啊，非常便利。这些都是近几年来一带一路来带来的一些好的政策啊。How things have changed. Thirty years ago, people on this side of the border wanted to go west. Now Russians are wanting to come east. It really shows how far China has come. My trip in Mancholi is coming to an end, but there's lots more to discover about the Sino-Russian relation. And for that, I'll be headed to Harbin, the music city of China. This is Harbin, a city with deep-rooted Russian connections. At Harbin's main street, the city's Russian flavor is hard to miss. Walking along the street, you find dozens of Russian souvenir shops and restaurants, like this Russian restaurant right here, famous for its bread. Look at all these people queuing up. This is the only place in China that I've ever seen people in line for bread. And no, it's not some new hipster fad. Families in Harbin have been bread eaters for more than a hundred years. Russian flavor extends to the city's urban landscape. Stunning examples of Art Deco and Neo-Renaissance architecture from the 1920s and 1930s line the main street. Why do we see so much Russian and European influence here in Harbin? Uh, it's Gangdo 东方的小巴黎 mm, ah, interesting, huh? The old name for Harbin is Manchuria, a city steeped in history. It had been governed by three different powers, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Chinese. At the turn of the 19th century, it was an industrial powerhouse with a thriving economy which funded these spectacular buildings. Wow, this church is magnificent. Can you tell me how old it is? Uh, it's like this. In 1898年之后,各国的移民就是来到了哈尔滨。那么他们要进行宗教活动。于是呢,当时的政府呢,就在1907年就修建了一个专门为俄国随军的这些士兵服务的天主教堂,就是圣索菲亚大教堂。
Harbin was an expat paradise, with people from over 50 different nationalities who formed 60% of the city's population. The city museum has recreated visuals of what the city looked like at the time, and boy, it looks nothing like China. In the 1910s and 20s, Harbin hosted the largest Russian population outside of the state of Russia. Their influence on the Chinese people remain till this day. We the Russians left much more than bread, ballet, and buildings behind. Harbin also inherited a major manufacturing base, which was built by the Russians. The Russians and Chinese draw on the legacy of that long friendship. They work together in furthering many mutual goals, like in education and science. This is the Heilongjiang Institute of High-Tech Research. Here, Russian and Chinese scientists work together on a thermal engineering project. A translator aids communication, but language is hardly a barrier when causes are aligned. For the Russians, unlike many of their Western counterparts, there's none of that paranoia associated with Chinese tech research. There's even a bilateral plan for Russia and China to jointly develop their artificial intelligence capabilities. This partnership has grown, and it's grown far beyond industrial cooperation. There's an extensive infrastructure designed to foster cooperation up and down the line. From summits at the very top, to commissions between governments, and down to networks closer to people's hearts and minds in education. Nowadays, every Russian university or research center in every region and city has a sister institute in China. Neither Russia nor China has a similar arrangement with any other country in the world. I'm here today to meet some students who have benefited from these excellent bilateral ties. Oh, hey guys. Hey, hey. hey. how are you doing? All my new Russian friends are here on some form of Chinese government scholarship. So Adele, why did you choose to come study here in China? Hmm, interesting question. <laughs> because my bachelor degree also was about Chinese languages. And I chose China because China gave us scholarships because uh, now many Russian and Chinese companies, they have like relations and then sell, buy something to each other. So is studying Chinese popular amongst your friends back in Russia? It's very popular. And now the relationship between China and Russia is very good and it's getting better and better. So now a lot of Russians, Russian people, we don't just study English, but we also started to study Chinese at schools. So a lot of Russians go to China to get their bachelor degree, master's degree in China right now, and it's easier for us to get Chinese scholarship rather than, for example, American or European countries scholarship. So Max, what has your experience been like here in China? Every foreigner who came to China uh, will, on this journey, uh, will understand that uh, it's a lot of uh, cultural shocks 
like uh, style of communication is different than uh, in uh, other countries and also languages and um, relationships between people, uh, Quincy, as we see here in China. But I think it's a good choice. And what are your plans after you graduate? I really want to go to uh, Shanghai because uh, I have been there for six times and I really love that city. So what about the rest of you? Are your long-term plans to remain here in China? Yeah. Yes, yes, we want to stay sure. Thank you very much. All right, well, we got our local eats here. I'm excited about this. Well, I have to say, this is definitely a happening spot. I mean, do you guys have anything like this in Russia? No, honestly, we don't have this in Russia. Like, when I came to China the first time and I saw this night market, I was like, wow, China is very interesting at night. So you can buy anything here. And, well, I'm a student, so I don't have a lot of money. So it's actually very good for me to go here and eat, just buy some clothes, I don't know, anything I want. This is really cool, honestly, very interesting. Well, since you're a student here, why don't you, you should be the one eating that. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Now, all of you earlier mentioned that you guys want to live and work in China, do business here. I'm curious to know, what is it like to do business in China uh, in comparison to what it might be like in Russia? Well, I have to ask the mandatory BRI question, and maybe I'll ask you then, Max. All right. Um, do you feel that your future opportunities are directly linked to the success of BRI? I think with the rapid development of a world economy and a international trade, uh, One Belt, One Road actually going to help all uh, small businesses and small companies um, to give all of these companies a good opportunity to work. I think uh, it's a good thing for all foreigners who live uh, in China right now. Well, it sounds like everyone feels it's a very favorable thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, well, enjoy your uh, sauce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My journey on China's new Silk Road has brought me to Harbin, the music city. The title is an official one, conferred by the United Nations in 2010, no less. It's also a title Harbin truly deserves. The locals are die-hard fans of Russian classical music, and the love affair goes way back. Around the 1900s, Harbin was nicknamed the St. Petersburg of the East. It was home to a rich cultural scene, including China's first symphony orchestra made up of mostly Russian musicians. Harbin had as many as 30 music schools where many prominent international musicians trained. The foreigners left during Second World War, but the Chinese, who remained, certainly didn't let the music fade out. In 2016, Harbin unveiled its tribute to their pedigreed musical heritage, an opera house. It cost 560 million US dollars. For a city so passionate about the arts, they consider it money well spent. The Opera House isn't Harbin's only big ticket investment in the arts. This is its other, a conservatory built in the neoclassical style 
costing a cool 116 million US dollars. Isn't this place spectacular? I feel like I'm in a Russian palace. Inside, you'll find the softer aspect of the Belt and Road Initiative, what China likes to call people-to-people -people bonds. For most classes in this conservatory, the teacher-student ratio is one-to-one. -one. I thought it was nice, but you think it's so-so. Uh, Always uh, there is something to improve. Uh. So it's like process for life. 我对待学生就是通过一带一路来上这个海音有这么好的机会走进这么优秀的学校嗯真的非常开心然后我的老师竟然也是个外教哇我可以比别人好这么多我可以学习到非常丰富的东西这个太开心了感觉这么天上难道
The Russians who controlled it lost it to the Japanese in 1935. The Chinese later took it back, and today, Harbin is a main port of call along the Trans-Siberian Railway linking Beijing to Moscow. With the Belt and Road Initiative, there are even bigger plans to link Harbin to Central Asia and Russia. Just like how the old railway turned Harbin into a cosmopolitan city, the new railway is expected to bring equally monumental changes to wherever its tracks run, crossing exciting new frontiers and creating new opportunities for development. Over the next few installments in this series, I'll be visiting other major points on the Belt and Road connecting China to Russia. In Mongolia, the Belt and Road is facilitating a resource boom in the country. But Mongolians are seriously concerned about the impact of the new Silk Road on the environment and on the ancient traditions of its people. In Uzbekistan, another keynote on the China-Russia economic corridor, the ancient Silk Road cities are undergoing a revival as new plans are unveiled to plug them into the modern Silk Road highway. And my final destination in the weeks ahead is Russia. With political problems mounting between Russia and the US and China and the US, the Kremlin and Beijing are drawing closer with important consequences for the global geopolitical order. My stay in China's border cities has shown me that the Chinese-Russian relationship runs deep. Whether it's in history and culture, or science, technology, and education, this relationship will have a huge impact on the countries between here and Russia. And I'll be visiting those countries in Mongolia and Central Asia in the weeks ahead. Should the world fear a Russian-China collusion, or should it welcome a Russian-China alliance? Whatever your views are on this, there is no question that the two powers are drawing closer, bound by new roads, bridges, and railways on a new Silk Road that will soon reach the heart of the Kremlin. <laughs>